Microsoft's privacy advisor doesn't trust Microsoft. Protests in Sudan lead to internet censorship, and the latest NSA leaks detail a massive metadata repository on American citizens. All that and more, this time on ThreatWire. Hello, welcome to ThreatWire. I'm Darren Kitchen. I'm Shannon Morse. This is your summary of what's threatening security, privacy, and internet freedom. You ready? I'm ready. We've got a lot this week. Last we week, actually, Curbs on Security.com reported about an identity theft service that had broken into the computer systems of some of the largest business data aggregators in the United States. Of course, those being Dun & Bradstreet, Altegrity, Cole, Background America, and LexisNexis, they apparently all fell victim to SSNDOB.MS, an underground forum focused on selling social security numbers and other personal information with uh, you know records going anywhere between 50 cents and 250 and uh, you know five to fifteen dollars for uh, credit and background checks. So this week, Curbs on Security is following up with a report on another hack. This way, uh, but this time the data brokers are interested in NW3C, or the National White Collar Crime Center. Oh. It's a nonprofit. It's uh, congressionally funded. They provide training, support, and research to agencies involved in the prevention and prosecution and investigation of cybercrime. Evidence is showing that the attackers broke in using a cold fusion exploit. So. Actually, none of these were zero-day attacks either. In fact, one of the exploits was a bug that Adobe had fixed in 2010. Ooh, that's no good. <laughs> these are the people with all of them. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Now, Casper Bowden was the author of Microsoft's privacy policy from 2002 all the way up to 2011 for 40 countries outside of the U.S. Now, due to the reveal that Microsoft was involved with Prism, Bowden has said that he does not trust Microsoft now. He is ditching his mobile phone and changing to a purely open source software world. Now, in a quote, Bowden says, the public now has to think about the fact that anybody in public life or a person in a position of influence in government business or bureaucracy now is thinking about what the NSA knows about them. So how can we trust that the decisions that they make are objective and that they aren't changing the decisions that they make to protect their career? That strikes at any system of representative government. Also, it's following up with the NSA, the latest leak from whistleblower Edward Snowden outlines the details of the social graph program. The program uses metadata from public data sources, including Facebook, voter registration records, tax data, and property tax records to create links between intelligence entities. The leaked NSA documents show chaining of phone numbers and email addresses in a system known as Mainway, which in 2011, there was a memo that noted that it had taken 700 million phone records per day. And by August 2011, it had increased to some 1.1 billion additional cell phone records daily. Now, the metadata repository takes 20 billion record events every day, allowing the NSA analysts to, well, access them within 60 minutes. Entity types include things like phone numbers, email addresses, IP addresses, and other described by a top secret document in addition to 164 relationship types. The system is actually, uh, seems to be enriched in addition to uh, location data from GPS services, including TomTom, Tom, online social networks, and of course, billing records. Oh. Now, in 2010, an internal NSA briefing from the Office of Legal Counsel said that data collected about U.S. persons can be retained for up to five years online or an additional 10 years offline, you know, for historical searches. Oh, right, of course. That completely <laughs> makes sense. <laughs> now, back in the early 2000s, Quest CEO Joseph Naccio was tried and found guilty of insider trading at his company. He was in jail until this month, four years after being convicted, and now he feels vindicated. What for? Now, what is strange about this is that Naccio had a meeting with the NSA regarding spying on customers not long before 9-11. Now, he actually refused because his lawyers thought this would be illegal for the NSA to spy on our customers at Quest. Then his company started losing government contracts. Hmm. hmm. Coincidence? Maybe. Now, this would coincide with the reports of a warranted, warrantless surveillance program, noting that Quest was the only holdout. Ha ha. Now, Naccio couldn't use any of this information during his trials because it was all considered classified at the time. Naccio believes that his prosecutors were politically motivated due to the refusal to tap into his customers' communications. And while he went the legal route for all of his trials, he was totally legal. He was completely unsuccessful and he was still convicted of something completely different. The law.
crazy. Protests. Protests in Sudan. They have spurred a new level of censorship. Of course, the censorship we've come to expect from that region. Mm -hmm. uh, during a Minister of Interior press conference, the minister stated that photographs that have been circulating on social media uh, sites of security forces shooting at demonstrators uh -huh. were in fact faked. And when a journalist, you know, asked, um, you know, the minister why he was keep continuing to lie about these, well, that journalist was arrested and beaten. <gasps> yeah. Internet access throughout the country has been intermittent or completely off during the protests against the government. Now, according to the Sudan Tribune, the Sudanese embassy in the United States issued an official statement denying that the government had any involvement in the shutdown. However, Doug Mattery of internet monitoring firm Renesis told The Guardian, normally with a failure of this type that isn't government directed, like a power failure or a cable cut, internet providers switch to their satellite backups. But we haven't seen that in this case. It is a total shutdown as happened previously in Egypt. Still, some tech-savvy Sudanese have worked around the limitations, including Abina CrowdMap. It's a tool that accepts reports from SMS, verifies the data, and plots events for categories such as deaths, demonstrations, arrests, and destruction. Ooh. Yeah. That's crazy. You gotta get it out there. I wanna check out that app. That's awesome. Now, last week we asked how far are you willing to go to protect your privacy, and our comment of the week comes from Android is best, who wrote, I would move to Mars. <laughs> nice. This week. That's all he said. <laughs> no question, but we'd like to remind you that threatwire.org is the place to subscribe to continue receiving the show and also get involved in our Google Plus community for continued discussions on stories like these. Like these. So Microsoft has received over 35,000 requests from authorities for end user data in 2013, on par with their results for last year, which was well over 75,000. Now the report, which Microsoft just released, does not include security related requests such as those under FISA. Microsoft is currently suing the US for permission to reveal all of those requests. See, Microsoft, that makes you look good. Yeah. What does an NSA employee do with their vast security clearance? Well, obviously spy on an ex-lover. That's what one employee did in 2005 and was punished with a reduction in grade, 45 day restrictions and 45 days of extra duty and half pay for two months. An internal NSA audit recommended he not be given security clearance. The NSA analysts called this kind of spying love int. Never has the NSA employee ever received any kind of criminal charges for misuse of the power, only, you know, internal punishment. Good stuff, it's right? It's hilarious that that's actually happened more than once there's in the NSA. And there's love int. <laughs> yes. And with all of that, I'm Darren Kitchen. I'm Shannon Morse. We'll see you on the internet. Bye. Love and. <laughs>